Well, greetings and welcome to today's webinar titled Helpful Coaching is in the Eye of the Customer, presented by David Verbal. My name is Dwayne Butcher of Lean Frontiers and I will serve as your host today. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar will be recorded for on-demand playback, so you can look for a link to the recording shortly after we conclude the webinar. Feel free to share this link with others in your organization. If you have questions during today's short session, you may ask them using the chat feature of the GoToWebinar toolbar. I will field those questions and ask them of the presenter toward the end of our time together. In order to get to your questions, please submit them well before our 2 p.m. Eastern ending time. And just to note, today's webinar is held in conjunction with the inaugural Lean Coaching Summit, which is being hosted by Lean Frontiers and the Lean Enterprise Institute. Our presenter today will be one of the impressive list of presenters at the summit, which is being held in Orlando, Florida, December 4th and 5th. So if coaching is important to you and your organization, you won't want to miss this inaugural event. You can learn more by visiting the summit website at www.leancoachingsummit.com. So let me introduce our presenter for today, David Verbal. David applied his organizational skills at Toyota's Georgetown, Kentucky plant, where he worked in management and organizational development during the facility startup phase and beyond. During his 10 years with Toyota, David became manager of the human resource de development at Georgetown and then manager of human resource development for the North American Manufacturing at Toyota's manufacturing headquarters in Erlanger, Kentucky. Before his tenure at Toyota, David was responsible for organizational development as assistant to the dean of the College of Education, University of Kentucky. He currently aids companies implementing Lean through the Lean Transformations Group. So, without further ado, I'll turn things over to David. David? Well, thank you, Wayne. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining this webinar. Um, as you know, the, the Lean Coaching Summit's coming up, and uh, I'm going to be presenting at that, but I was also asked to, to sort of put out a teaser, I guess you would call it. And, and do a webinar, uh, spend an hour talking to you. I wish I could be talking with you, but I'm going to be talking to you uh, based on my experience with coaching. Uh, I will confess I am a coach. That's how I make my living. Uh, I work with a lot of companies coaching managers and executives and leaders, um, trying to help them develop. I also teach um, a workshop for the Lean Enterprise Institute on coaching skills for lean leaders. Um, coaching is something I have been deeply interested in, involved in, uh, since my days in Toyota. Um, I started out in Toyota on the other side of things, receiving a, a lot of coaching, particularly from the Japanese, who were trying to help me understand the, the Toyota way. Um, so, let's launch into uh, some slides that I've put together, uh, using them as, as sort of a vehicle to share some thoughts with you and to keep me on track. And uh, uh, I will, t not going to read the slides to you, I plan on trying to talk around them. And I'm not getting my slides to advance, there we go, sorry. Um, topic today. The, the, as you notice, the, the title is Helpful Coaching is in the Eye of the Customer. Uh, and that's kind of an unusual take on, on coaching, I guess, because uh, we don't generally think of it as a customer-supplier relationship. But this is in the context of lean and continuous improvement, and that is some thinking we need to bring to bear on that particular relationship. Um, and in particular, the, the part of the coaching activity responsibility that I want to focus on is when we're trying to coach some with prob someone with problem solving responsibility. If, if we take it that problem solving is an absolutely core essential activity to lean and continuous improvement, then leaders, 
continuous improvement facilitators, others end up doing a lot of uh, coaching of other people who are trying to solve problems themselves. And so that, that's the focus I want to take. Uh, outline of what we're going to look at. Um, in a minute we're going to talk about process and how I hope this hour proceeds. Uh, then the, the content of the, what we're going to do is essentially look at three questions. What is helpful coaching? How do you do helpful coaching? And then how do you do helpful coaching for someone about their problem-solving thinking? And then we'll leave you an opportunity at the end, if I can manage to stay on tight time, and give you a chance to put some questions to me, and then we'll wrap up for, for the session. So purpose, what are we trying to do here? Answer the questions, what kind of coaching is helpful for someone with problem-solving responsibility, and how do you do it? The people, me, I've got the microphone and the slides, and you, you're out there listening, I hope, watching the slides probably, uh, but unfortunately you can't talk back to me, and that would be the ideal situation as far as I'm concerned, if we could discuss this. Process, I'm going to ask a lot of questions. I invite you to talk back to me inside your head. Uh, I invite you to think about those questions so at least we can have uh, you engaged in an interior dialogue with me. I'll share my thoughts on the question, questions and at the end you can put some questions to me. So let's move right in. What's, uh, what is helpful coaching? For me that question raises two other questions. When is coaching not helpful? And why is co why why does coaching for problem solving need to be helpful in the eye of the customer? I share a story with you that uh, it really goes to where I got I guess my wake up call about coaching and about what is helpful in terms of coaching. Uh, this would go back to, the, to my Toyota days, and, and reasonably early in the Toyota days. Uh, one of the first things I was responsible for was developing training for managers and leaders in doing A3s. Uh, of course, I didn't know what an A3 was, so I had a, a learning curve of trying to um, stay ahead of the people I was working with. But at some point, I got to, to a feeling I, I had a pretty good understanding, and, and uh, the, the delivery method it was, a, it was a dual approach of classroom education and the participants doing their own A3s and getting coaching in and out of class. Um, and I, what I, the story I remember, the incident I remember, is with Julia. She was a, was a team leader, and I think it was stamping. Uh, and she brought me her first A3 to look at. And she'd done a pretty good job. Um, I read through it, and then I walked back through, and I asked her, uh, what, are you, what are you trying to communicate here? What's the story you're trying to tell? Uh, and then I went on to get a little deeper and point out some places I thought she could make her story stronger. I asked questions to... Uh, to, about what she, what the problem was, and how she knew the cause, and all that sort of stuff, and um, then wrapped up. And I said, uh, "Well, was that helpful?" And she said, uh, "I don't know." And I said, "You don't know?" And she said, "No, I don't know. I'm just wondering if it was helpful to you." And I said, "What do you mean?" She said, "Well, you've been doing all the thinking." Well, I was uh, a little bit taken aback. British have a term, gobsmacked. It sort of uh, hit me like that. And uh, I uh, had to stop and think. I guess my first thought was, well, that's pretty ungrateful. I hear I've tried to share my insight with her. Uh, but then my second thought was, uh, no, actually, uh, I've probably violated her space. I have intruded in her thinking. Um, 
I don't think I really have been very helpful because I took over the thinking. I was doing all the thinking. She's right. From that point on, I have, have made it my business to um, try to understand what is helpful for another person in terms of coaching. Uh, so, reflection. We have, uh, we always have, have good intentions as coaches. Uh, but for coaching to be helpful, it ultimately has to be experienced as helpful by the coachee, by the person receiving it. And that means uh, the coachee has to be open to receiving the coaching, and they have to be ready to use it and able to use it. Um, so those are sort of some preconditions. Let's think about those, those for a minute. Let's think about the need for the coachee to be ready to and open to receive coaching. I've got a, an old joke and an old, an old saying I'll share with you that I think applies here. Uh, most of you probably not young enough to remember the 70s, uh, maybe the 80s, but there was a joke that was, there were the light bulb jokes were big, and one of them was, how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? The answer is it doesn't matter how many psychologists you've got. The light bulb most has got to want to change. Uh, there's another, another expression that I, I heard, I guess, from the Japanese. I think it goes back to Buddhism and, and stuff like that. It also, I'm sure, um, can have an origin in North America, and that is simply when the student is ready, the teacher will come. That has, to me, a lot of application to the business of coaching. So, think a minute. Why do open and ready make a difference if you're going to be coaching? My thought is, because ultimately, in spite of your best intentions, you may be able to tell a person what to do, but you're not going to get very far by telling them what to think or how to think. And to take that a little further, if, if you've got somebody that doesn't know how to do something, um, you, can, you can do pretty well in telling and showing and explaining and demonstrating to help them learn something. And you can even use observation and coaching to help them correct their performance. But telling some what, someone what to do or think doesn't work as well when it comes to their thinking about how to apply a process they already know or think that they know. If somebody feels they have the capability, they are just not as open to being told what to do. Problem solving is a process that requires thinking. And my experience is most people know how to do it. Even if they are looking for coaching, they still basically believe they know how to problem solve. So I want to suggest we talk generally about coaching, but not all coaching is the same, and not all coaching has the same purpose. Or another way of saying it, there is coaching, and then again, there is coaching. This is a form of coaching, uh, and it's a necessary form of coaching. This is another form of coaching that um, Socrates used to try to lead and influence people and help them develop their thinking. Two very different forms of coaching um, for two very different purposes, and each has its time and place. Uh, but what I want to suggest is that the drill instructor approach, which is essential to helping people learn the things they need to learn to survive uh, in the military and on the battlefield, is not the same as the coaching you need to de help someone develop their problem-solving thinking. That, I think, comes closer to Socrates. So, how can you find out? if the coachee is open and ready to receive your coaching. Well, here we draw on lean. It's very simple. 
ask. It's my suggestion. Ask. Get the voice of the customer. The, the coachee is somebody who is trying to do something or get something done. They have an aim. They have an objective. As we're looking at here, it's probably something to do with addressing a problem. Ask the person, ask them, what are you trying to do? How are you trying to do it? Ask them, why are you trying to do it? That will give you a sense of where he or she is in his thinking about the problem, the situation. I might point out that what I'm stressing here is ask the person what they're trying to do. Ask the person what they're trying to do. To accomplish. Ask the person what they're thinking. Don't ask them about the problem itself. Go, go one step away and find out what's in the person's mind about it. Then you're in a position to say, okay, how do you feel I can help you? You're, you're trying to get something done here. How do you feel I can help you? I'm going to bring a little, another, another thing into play here. Um, You probably have run across somewhere or another, if you're involved in lean and continuous improvement, um, a scale that, that's used to describe a person's readiness for uh, performing, or ready, and in this case, readiness for applying lean thinking and practices. Uh, working from the bottom up, and I have lost the ability to advance slides again. Sorry about that, folks. David, you might try clicking, uh, right-clicking the slide and choosing. I that. am. There we go. Every time something pops up on the screen, it shuts me out. Um, so that uh, that scale, it ranges from know about at the bottom able to teach at the top. And in the middle, you've got knows how and why to do something, is able to do something, able to perform it, is able to do it consistently, and is able to apply in new situations. Getting a sense of where the coachee is in terms of this uh, can give you an awfully good idea of, of how to proceed. Obviously, if they don't know how to do something or they don't know about it, then you're going to have to to tell them and demonstrate for them. If they're able to do it uh, or they need to be able to do it, you need to put them to doing it and coach their performance as they go. But beyond that point, if they're able to do or they're trying to apply, then we're into the territory of thinking. And there you have to approach them differently is, is the point I want to make. So, listening to them describe what they're trying to do and how they're trying to do it will help you match your coaching to the person's need and level. But there's a challenge for you in this, because you're a human being. As soon as somebody starts describing a problem to you, your automatic problem-solving gear will kick in, and you're going to have to work against that. You're going to have to try your best to hear the person out without jumping in with your own ideas of what to do. Because your purpose here, your aim here, is to grasp the other person's situation, grasp the situation of the other person's readiness to be coached, their openness to being coached, uh, where they are in terms of their thinking. It's a challenge. It's a balancing act, this, coaching somebody on their problem-solving thinking coaching them on, on any kind of thinking. Uh, on one hand, you want and you've got to, if you're going to help them with their thinking, keep them engaged in their own thinking. And the key to that is to not take it over. On the other side, in order to help them, you have to help them be more aware of what they know and how they know it and what they're thinking and why they're thinking it. In other words, you have to get them to look at what they are thinking to help them develop, grow, move forward in their, in their problem-solving thinking. 
going to suggest uh, maybe you take a minute now and let's let's try that. Uh, let's let's look at a situa a little situation here. Uh, let's put you in the role of Lee Shannon, the CI facilitator, and this in this company that create uh, that manufactures control modules and it goes into lots of different stuff. And you've been on vacation a week and you got back and you got some emails waiting for you. We're going we're going to look at uh, three of them as the day goes along. This particular one is from uh, Jason Redden, who is the first shift team leader in, in one of the control module areas. And Jason is telling you that he's heard you talk to teams about the importance of operator continuous improvement. Uh, and you, you stress that the most important improvements come from operator performance, uh, problem solving efforts. Um, and he's saying, will you come talk to my CI team in the sealer area when you're back? He says, they're getting discouraged because they keep running into problems getting the new robot to distribute the sealer evenly. And it's taking a lot, lot longer than they thought to complete their improvement plan. Also, every day the robot's not fixed. It's cutting into their production. So they're, they're feeling in a real bind. He's asking, will you come talk to his team about the importance of them being engaged in continuous improvement and them initiating efforts like the one they're involved in. So, take a minute now. How would you respond to Jason? What would you say? I'm going to give you a minute to think. I'll take it a little further. Let's start with this. What was your first instinct? Did you think, yeah, I'll go do it? Or did you think, well, why does he want me to do that? How's that going to help? Um, following that, what was your assessment of Jason's openness and readiness for coaching as a problem-solving thinker? What's your assessment of where Jason is in terms of his current problem solving? Thank you. I had the feeling that he really wasn't taking responsibility for the problem. I also had the, the, the feeling that he was sort of jumping to solutions. Um, so I felt if I was going to be helpful as a coach, rather than saying, yes, I'll take this over and help you with it, um, I needed to get Jason to think back to the to the situation of his team and the problems they're having. I mean, need to get him as their leader to to focus on those. Um, I might say, I, I would I don't mind talking, but talking doesn't solve problems. Uh, your team is working on these problems. I might ask him, how can you? What's what's the biggest one they're trying to deal with, and how can you? help them resolve that problem? What, what support can you give them? What coaching can you give them? Um, what do you know about that problem? Uh, maybe when you've looked into that, come back and let's talk a little bit more. Um, then maybe I can be, be some real help rather than just talking. Don't know what you came up with. There are no right or wrong answers. I'm not trying to stress that. Um, it's just a question of wanted you to think about what you would decide to ask Jason, what you would decide to say to him, because this is a coachable moment. All right, well, let's move on to the second question. If, if we're putting out this idea of helpful coaching, and we've said some is and some isn't, and if you're dealing with problem-solving thinking, uh, coaching that takes over the thinking is probably not helpful, then how do you do coaching that is helpful? And obviously the critical related question is, how do you coach someone's problem-solving thinking without taking over the problem-solving responsibility? My immediate response is ask questions 20 times more than, and more than you give answers. And then that obviously leads to another question. What kind of questions? 
And my response would be something called humble inquiry questions. This is an aspect of coaching that I have learned through practice and through some study, and I want to suggest it to you as a, a very valuable, critical problem uh, behavior for coaching problem-solving thinking. You're the coach and somebody else has got the problem. So what is, what is this humble inquiry? What does it consist of? Well, first, it consists of asking open-ended questions that truly seek to learn what the other person knows. Truly, I mean, questions that are interested, curious about what the other person knows and thinks. Second, that means you've got to be asking questions you don't think you already know the answers to. And third, it's asking questions that show respect for the other person's ability to think by the very simple act of allowing them to think and listening to their thinking. That's a useful practice for a coach. You learn a lot. Open-ended questions, and what's so good about open-ended questions? Because they allow the other person to respond with whatever's on their mind, with whatever they know and whatever they're thinking. Um, and that is in just in of itself often very useful to somebody to have to express what, what they've been carrying around in their head, uh, to hear what it sounds like and get some, maybe even get some perspective on it. What's bad about closed questions, those yes or no questions? They lead the other person toward responding to what you know or are thinking. They're generally set up questions. They're, they're seeking a response to what's on your mind or what you think is the case. What's bad about that? that means you have limited the other person in, to a thinking box. You've put them in a thinking box. They can only deal with what you have put forth rather than looking at their own thinking. In that case, that makes the, the, the situation all about you and what's on your mind, and you don't learn much beyond what you already know and think, and the coachee doesn't have to think much beyond what they came in thinking and what you're thinking. So I want to stress that open-ended questions are helpful in coaching problem-solving thinking. In fact, I think they're critical. Closed and leading questions are not. They stop the other person from thinking and putting them in a position of having to react. Look at some examples. On the left side, some pretty typical coaching questions. On the right, some, some questions that I suggest are more helpful alternatives. Did you do X? Did you look at X? What do you know about happened in it? what happened with X is a more helpful alternative. What do you know? What, why did you do X? What do you know about how X happened? What are you going to do about X? Why do you think X happened? When do you, will you have X fixed? What are you thinking should be done about X? How are you going to make sure X doesn't happen again? Why do you think it will improve things with X? Notice that the, the helpful alternatives are asking, what do you know, what do you think, why do you think it? The typical coaching questions, which I guarantee you I've heard from plenty of managers, uh, carry a load of accusation and blame to them. Um, they, they tend to shut the other person down, uh, and they tend to seek reaction, not thoughts, ideas, and observations. Give, give you an example to look at, okay? Uh, if you've read Managing to Learn, which I recommend as a case study in developing and coaching somebody. Uh, here, here's a couple of pages of dialogue from Sanderson and Porter. This is Sanderson is, has looked at Porter's first A3 and they're meeting to discuss it. So Sanderson studied the revised A3 from Porter and he starts off, before we talk about your proposal, your idea for what to do, let's talk about the problem. 
what exactly is the problem you're trying to address? And Porter says, well, costs are high, process is too slow, and there are too many errors. And Sanderson says, well, how do you know that? And he says, from talking to Francis and purchasing and others. And Sanderson says, well, what else have you discovered? And Porter says, well, the process is very complex. We have multiple vendors with varying costs. And Sanderson says, why? And Porter says, well, it's because Japanese to English is difficult to translate, and there's a whole lot of um, volume of work. And Sanderson stops. And makes an observation. Well, that seems to me pretty vague in general. Do you know how this process, the, the, this translation process works? Can you tell me what's causing the problems in the delays? What's actually causing the cost overruns? And Porter says, well, the work gets backed up, and the translators have to work overtime. Uh, and Sanderson says, OK, so delays call back, back, cause backlogs, and that causes downtime. Now we're getting somewhere. So what's causing the delays? And Porter sort of comes back around full circle. Well, I guess it's the volume of work. Um, Porter says, perhaps, rather than saying, ah, that doesn't get us anywhere. He says, perhaps. Tell me, what do you know about the pro how the process actually works? Uh, and Porter says, well, the documents originate in Japan, the production shops. They're sent to one of three translator groups who do their work and then send them to the appropriate person in the appropriate shop. And Sanderson says, how do you know this? And Porter says, well, I've read some documents from the original plant startup, and I've based my plans on what I knew and what I heard around the plant, and I talked to Francis. And Sanderson says, OK, I see. How can, how can you tell how well this is working? What performance criteria are you using? I see you've looked at cost. What about quality? Does the vendor have, have the highest quality, uh, with the highest quality, have the same lead time? And Porter says, I don't know. And is a little surprised that, that Sanderson has, seems to have a better sense of the nuances of the processes he's trying to fix than he did. Now, obviously, Sanderson had some observations and some opinions about Porter's thinking here. But other than the observation, well, that problem's definition is a little vague. Uh, he doesn't really say anything um, to express those opinions. He just keeps asking Porter questions about what he knows and how he knows it. Uh, and eventually, Porter comes down to see that he doesn't know as much as he thought he did. And maybe he's gotten ahead of himself. And in fact, this is this sends Porter back to work on his second A3. So I want to suggest coaching another person on their problem-solving thinking is a relationship. But it can't be this kind of relationship, top-down and directive. It needs to be this kind of relationship. Equal think equals thinking together. Now, that doesn't mean that Sanderson's no longer Porter's manager. It just means as they talk about the problem, they are two people thinking together, trying to answer questions together. No one has a leg up on anybody else. In fact, if you're going to do humble inquiry and you're coaching somebody on their problem-solving thinking, I want to suggest that you almost certainly don't know as much about the problem situation as the person who's trying to address it. So you have to be thinking partners. You need to bring your experience with the problem solving process and the other person's knowledge of the problem situation together. And that is a fundamentally different relationship than we strive for in most coaching and most leading. Another quick chance for you to apply a little of this. In this case, um, you're still Lee Shannon, and the second shift team leader uh, has sent you an email. She wants you to know that there's some overtime going to be charged to you. Quality was looking at scrap from the sealer process. 
the numbers are way up, um, and they wanted her to find out why the CI team wasn't making any progress on improvements in the sealer process. So she came in early the next day to spend some time. She's got a couple of ideas that she thinks will cut down on the robot faults that are causing the sealer not to distribute the seal, get the sealer to not get distributed evenly. She says, I know you want to give the team time to work through the problems themselves, but we need to show quality that we're making improvements. How do you want me to handle this? So she is asking you what to do. My question is, how would you respond and what would you ask? What would you say back to Marie? How would you, what would you ask Marie? So my observation is that Marie's got good intentions, um, but she's feeling responsibility, and she is sort of jumping to solutions. Um, she is not considering uh, what's been going on with the team. She hadn't been involved in it, and she's really not thinking too much about it. Uh, so I would slow her down a little by asking her some humble questions about what's the, the improvement team been working on? Uh, what does she know about what they've been doing? What does she know about the problems they've run into? Um, what does she know about how her ideas for changes fit with theirs? Um, I would finally end up asking her, what do you think you can do to get the team to take a look at your ideas? How, how do you think that um, you can help the team by sharing your ideas rather than just going ahead? Again, a coachable moment, and the question is, how do you use humble inquiry to help Marie look at other options? Sorry about this. How can you use humble inquiry to help Marie look at other options and concerns in the situation? Um, without telling her, Marie, I think you're just going to trample all over the team. How can you get her to look more broadly? The question I would leave you with is, what did you decide to do, and how did you decide to do it? Because I repeat, I think this is a coachable moment with Marie. All right, we've, we've covered two questions now. What is helpful coaching, and how do you do helpful coaching? I want to now take it a step further and say, how do you do helpful coaching for someone on their problem-solving thinking? Let's, let's get it down to the important issue here. My response, focus on the process, not the content of their problem-solving thinking. So what does that mean? Well, first off, it's not your role to judge the correctness of what they're thinking, because ultimately that judgment is going to be in comparison to what you're thinking. It is your role to help them become more aware of what their ideas, their claims, their assertions are based on, and to help them see if they are proceeding in a way that is consistent with the PDCA problem-solving process. In other words, I want to suggest that it is your role to help them use something called questioning mind and become more aware of what they actually know and how they know it and what they need to learn and how they can learn it. And why is this important? It's important because of the fundamental nature of the Plan, Do, Check, Act problem-solving process. It is dependent on information, is dependent on information about actual conditions. PDCA is not theoretical problem solving. PDCA is fact-based problem solving. And it, 
proceeds off of a practice called grasping the situation or grasping the actual condition. You grasp the situation to make a plan and you work on using that grasp to get a practical process for addressing a problem or need and for getting agreement to it. Once you start, you grasp the situation again as you're implementing to see what problems you're encountering and what problems you have to resolve to keep moving on your plan. When you get to the end of what you set about to do, then you stop and you check. You grasp the situation to see what have you accomplished, where are you, and how did you get there. And you reflect. What, what have you learned out of this? And then you grasp the situation again to decide what you need to do next to keep the cycle going, either to continue to address the problem or to move on to the next level. But it is all dependent on that grasp of the situation every step of the way, done repeatedly. Questioning mind is a good practice for problem solvers because it takes you back into grasping the situation. Questioning mind is when you think you know something, asking yourself, what do you actually know? How do you know it? And when you know what you know and don't know, then you can ask, what do you need to know? And how can you learn it? The nice thing about questioning mind, it is a way that coaches can help lead problem solving and help develop problem solving thinking by prompting questioning mind in other people. Why is this so important? Well, let's, let's look at our nature as problem solvers. We have a tendency to see a problem, get an idea about what to do about it, and jump straight to solution. I like to call this hopeful problem solving. I hope I got the right problem, I hope I got the right idea, and I hope I right, land the right place. There's another form of problem solving. You could say it's taking the low road rather than the high road. It's the low road that goes through facts rather than just ideas. And it is a path that proceeds to use those facts step by step to answer some fundamental questions. What's the real problem? What do you think is the problem? What's the real problem? If you're going to do something about it, what target condition are you going to try to reach? What do you, where do you need to be? What's, what's causing you to be in your current situation rather than at your target condition? What actions can you take to move you from the current condition where the problem is to the target condition? How, what plans can you make and get agreement to for doing that? And how can you know if, if your actions are effective? And finally, and most important really, how do you keep the problem solving learning cycle going as you are working through the problem, as you reach some point of conclusion, and as you continue going on? I call this actionable because it leads to concrete, realistic, practical actions. The high road is solutions thinking. It's also being called fast thinking. It's something that we do pretty well. However, the low road is the PDCA problem solving process. It's slow thinking, and it's something that we have to slow ourselves down to do. We have to slow ourselves down from jumping to conclusion, assumption, and solution. That's where a coach can help somebody very, very much. So. When, remember we talked about the, the importance of getting the person doing the problem solving thinking to talk about what they're thinking, talk about what they're trying to do, talk about how they're trying to do it, why they're trying to do it. This gives you the opportunity to look at the content of their problem solving thinking. If they're jumping solutions, that probably that tells they likely don't understand the nature of lean problem solving. Slow versus fast thinking. So that's probably where you need to start. If they assume they know what the problem is but describe it in general terms, then it's likely they don't realize that lean problem solving is based on a grasp of actual conditions. It's fact-based. 
maybe that means they just don't know about the Gimba and how to go to the Gimba. If they want to fix the problem itself, it's likely by doing something direct to it, it's likely they don't understand the basics of cause-effect relationship and that ultimately to el eliminate a problem, you've got to address its cause. If they assume that once they found the cause, it is the cause, then it's likely they haven't experienced the problem returning if you don't get the root cause. And finally, if they assume their solution is going to work because they thought of it, it's likely they aren't thinking of the countermeasure as an experiment, as a learning process, and they haven't thought of what will indicate it, that the countermeasure is effective. Just using this to see, see where they are can be a good guide to coaching them in terms of the problem-solving process. Let's uh, take one more run at uh, applying this thinking, if you're interested in wood. Uh, you're still Lee Shannon. In this case, Mike Holt, the head of the functional test team, uh, has sent you an email. And he's talked to engineering like he's, you suggested he do and he's frustrated. Every time that uh, there's a new design for a product, engineering doesn't pay any attention to the test area's fixtures when they decide how to put the interface connections on the modules. So half the time that means that once we put the module in, the connectors don't line up with the test leads on the fixtures we've got, and we either have to have them modified or get new ones. He says, I know this is going to happen with this new, the new modules we're getting ready to test. And as I'm, I, since it's, it's important that we get them tested on time and get them uh, proven on time, he's going to go ahead and start a PO for a vendor to, to work on new fixtures or modified fixtures. Once again, what would you ask Mike? How would you respond to him? What would you say? One thing you might do is ask yourself, what's my sense of where Mike is in his problem-solving thinking? Let's go back to, the, to these four point, five points. Where do you think Mike is? Is he jumping to solution? Does he assume he knows what the problem is? Is he trying to fix the problem itself? Does he know what the cause of the problem is? Is he just assuming his solution will work to address the problem. My feeling is he's doing several of those. He certainly is assuming he knows what the situation is going to be, and he's jumped straight to a solution that actually does nothing to fix the problem. It just works around it, uh, leaves the issue with engineering right where he is, where it is. Uh, I'm sure he said he had he talked to engineering. What I would want to know and what I want him to think about is, is what did you say to engineering? What did engineering say to you? Um, what, ha what have you been able to do to show engineering what the problems are? What can you do to help engineering understand the problem is, is it's creating for you? Um, I, I, I feel that Mike needs to take a lot more responsibility than he seems to have and he needs to get back and engage with engineering. He needs to understand their situation. He needs to try to help them understand his team situation uh, and he needs to see where that goes uh, before he assumes that nothing can be done and he jumps to a solution. Again, a coachable moment using humble inquiry. Would be easy to say, Mike, that's not I'm not we're not doing that. You gotta go back. Get back in there and with engineering and figure out what can be done. 
But before Mike is going to be ready to do that, he's got to see where he's where he's gotten himself. He needs to see that his thinking has taken him down a path of not particularly productive action based on a lot of assumptions. And as a coach, you can use humble inquiry to help him recognize those assumptions by getting him to look at what he knows and doesn't know and what he's thinking and why he's thinking it. Okay. Well, I want to use a baseball diamond to sum, it, sum up, and what I want to do is, is use this baseball diamond uh, to bring together the flow of the PDCA problem-solving process and the use of questions. So you start off at home base, at the plate, and let's assume that you need to get to first base. You need to get at least a hit to get you to first base. What does that require? It requires asking some questions. What's happening and what should be happening? Those are coach questions a coach can make sure the coachee is stopping to ask. That leads to determining the gap between the two. And when you know the gap, then you can specify the target condition you're trying to get to. The gap equals problem, the thing you're trying to address. Then you need to move on to second base because, because as we said, just fixing the problem, covering it up is not going to get you anywhere. Now, ultimately, to do something about that gap, that problem, you've got to understand why it's there, what's causing it. And that leads to the next question. Why are we here or why aren't we there? Why are we in the current situation or why aren't we at the target condition? What's causing the gap? What are the barriers in the gap? All that sort of stuff. The cause is producing the effect, and the effect is the gap. And to get rid of the effect and the gap, you've got to address the cause. Next step, you want to get to third base. You want to know what to do about the cause once you've found it. So how do we get to where we should be or need to be? Well, obviously, you're going to have to take action to address the cause, which means countermeasures to the cause and you're going to have to make a plan for executing them because they won't just happen. Once you start executing, you need to know where you're going. You need to have some indication of what will, what will be success for your effort. And you need to think about not just how do we get there, but how do we stay there. So that's proof. That proof, those indicators, um, metrics or whatever they are are useful both for guiding you to get there and they become a meter that you can use to help stay there. Once you're there, the last step, reflection. Think about some very basic things of what you've been through. What do the next steps need to be? Do you need to standardize so you can keep what you've gained? Do you need to continue to problem solve or do you need to improve? So I use this sort of little mental map to help me think as I guide a coachee. My, my, my mantra is you've got to touch all the bases. PDCA problem solving is going through all the bases. Sum it up. The value added of helpful coaching with humble inquiry. You help the other person see. You help them think. You let them solve problems themselves. And in doing so, you create a fundamentally different relationship in which you both can question and learn together. Thank you for sticking with this, if you have. And uh, I hope to see you at the upcoming Lean Coaching Conference in Orlando, December 4th and 5th. Uh, Wayne, I think I hear you in the background. So if there are questions, I'm open for them. Yeah, well, uh, David, thanks. First of all, uh, as a uh, as a true lean coach, I know that uh, these one sided, one way formats aren't ideal for you. So, thanks for uh, thanks for challenging us in the ways that you did. Um, and we did get a few questions come in. Um, I'll start off with this one, which is uh, very practical and logistical. But a number of people have asked if the slides might be available following uh, the webinar. 
Um, and that's something I, uh, David, I forgot to uh, ask of you. Uh, I'm, I'll tell you what my plan is. I spent a good deal of time working on this to try to, to sort through my ideas. Um, what I would like to do is make available to anyone who uh, either sends you or me um, a request um, a write-up of this. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna try to yes. turn this into a write-up um, with a little more detail than just the slides have. Yeah, that's, that's And I'll be good. glad to share that um, e either through LEI or through Lean Frontiers or through, through the Lean Transformations website or just on request. Yeah, okay, thank you, David. That, uh, that will more than suffice to have that write-up. Thank you. Um, so uh, a few of the questions that have come in. Um, how do you handle people who have never been allowed to make decisions or never been empowered in the past? Boy, that's a challenge, isn't it? Um, in, a, in a lot of organizations, um, people not only believe that it, it is, they're forbidden, it's, it's, they're not allowed to solve problems, they, th they feel it is dangerous to uh, offer their ideas on how to solve problems. What you have just said, though, is that the inclination and the thinking is there. Um, when working with managers in, in leadership development, uh, we talk about their responsibility if they're going to have employees involved in continuous improvement, creating what we call a safe zone a zone in which they can try out their ideas uh, to see how they work with coaching, of course, and with um, an, uh, enough guidance to make sure they, they don't do anything uh, that could be disastrous, but within, within a reasonable scope, trying out their ideas to see how they work. Um, only managers and leaders can do that uh, because ultimately managers and leaders are the ones who have probably can contribute to creating the the hostile environment to to people thinking uh, so the 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 effort to to define for this situation you're safe in trying this you're safe in coming out with your ideas let's let's make an agreement about that Let's make an agreement, however, that we're, we're going to be in discussion about what you're doing. Let's make an agreement that uh, you're, gonna, you're going to at least listen to my coaching and you're going to share with me what you learn. Okay, great. So another question that came in, uh, what are ways to assess your personal effectiveness as a coach without having to, what I guess, ask at the end of each interaction you have with someone? Are there, are there some ways that you can assess that effectiveness? Um, I'll, I'll give you some that I've learned. Um, and the first is why this whole session has been so difficult for me. Um, I find if I am doing more than 20% than of the talking, I'm probably wa uh, wasting my breath as a coach. Uh, one of the first ways to, to detect that is the glazed look in the eye as you're talking. Um, you see the other person's mind is somewhere else and not engaged. Uh, another is if you're all the way down the road offering suggestions and you're getting the yeah but response, uh, that means that the wall is up. Um, they're, they're listening politely but they're not really considering. Um, and that maybe you're just you're not being much help. Okay. Um, one more question: uh, how how can you use coaching with people that are perhaps more senior than yourself? Well, that's the nice place about nice thing or nice thing about humble inquiry is that it comes in very useful there. Um, I kind of modify it uh, 
and I, I, pre I, I preface a lot of my humble inquiry questions with, uh, I'm wondering, um, or I'd appreciate knowing, or um, help me understand this. Um, it, one, one of the advantages I have is, as a coach is that um, I, I know I don't know a whole lot about very many technical processes, uh, which kind of frees me up. Uh, I don't feel like I have to demonstrate that I know. I can ask dumb questions, questions that somebody who felt they had to had to have credentials as an expert couldn't ask. But I can I can see, I can look at what's going on, I can listen to what's being said, and I can ask dumb questions. Um, and I find that um, it's pretty powerful. And I have successfully used that in coaching a lot of senior people. Um, but I do it from a humble approach. I don't do it from telling them what I think they need to know. I use humble inquiry to, to get them to slow down a bit and look at what they think is going on, look at what uh, they think is the reason it's going on, to look at what they think ought to be done, and so I call it lift the rug, look underneath, ex examine the, their um, the reasons for what they're thinking. Um, an educator, a guy named John Dewey, is, I quote him a lot, he says, uh, has said, we have thoughts, ideas, opinions, solutions, all this stuff all the time. Our brains are constantly generating this stuff. But we don't really learn until we have to stop and look at why we're thinking what we're thinking, why we're claiming what we're claiming. That then, then we begin to understand what we're really trying to deal with. I find humble inquiry. I wonder inquiry. Uh, please, please help me understand inquiry. Uh, can be successful even with senior people. Well, great, uh, David. We are uh, just a tad bit over time, so we'll go ahead and uh, close things off now. But if you have additional questions, please keep them coming in to me, and I can pass them along to David. Or if you have David's contact information, contact him directly. Uh, David, let me again thank you for uh, not only for your insights today, but uh, really for your contributions to, to Lean and to coaching in Lean Enterprise. Uh, remember to today's webinar. Uh, has been recorded, and we will make that recording available after a short time of some processing that's required. You can look for an email shortly with a link to that session. And again, as, uh, as we both have mentioned, if coaching skills are something that you would like to further develop in yourself and to establish kind of a culture of coaching within your organization, I would highly encourage you to take advantage of the Lean Coaching Summit coming up December 4th and 5th in Orlando. Uh, LEI's John Shook will help us kick things off and close out the summit with a host of coaches uh, kind of in between those two times to help you on your own coaching journey. So because demand for the summit has exceeded our expectations, uh, you're going to need to reserve your spot uh, soon here in the next few days for what will undoubtedly be an outstanding exchange of ideas. So. You can visit the uh, Coaching Summit at www.leancoachingsummit.com for more information. Thanks again to David, to our partners at the Lean Enterprise Institute, and the hundreds of you who signed up for today's webinar. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody.